Um, so things kind of start there. We, we don't do all of the initial project or solution work ourselves. We have a lot of stakeholders and collaboration early, early on um, to make sure that it, there's going to be a um, continuity throughout the project. So there is some issues with collaboration. That's the purpose of the question is. Um, so folks in my group will work with um, people in Kathy's group and Sarah's group as we progress through project definition, which is what I do. I do kind of the big picture, more of a cartoon level solution, depending on the types of projects before it goes into engineering. I kind of help design the scope for the designers to go design. Um, so most of my job is, frankly, collaboration. Um, I rarely get to finish solving a problem. I just get to identify some of the issues and who needs to be in the room to solve it. So 75% of my job is bringing people together and documenting and bringing things close together. So I happen to like the collaboration part of my job. It's just what I end up doing. And then it goes off to Kathy mm -hmm. and your group. And so our, our primary role is um, project execution. So Jamie takes the, develops basically a concept, which would be roughly, say, maybe 15% development of an idea. And then we take it, bring it into design, procure it, construct it, and then hand it off to Sarah when it's complete. And once it comes to me, and, and it, it depends on, um, we like to look at things from cradle to grave. And um, a lot of times the cradle can't be defined until Jamie's group defines it. And then I can't take it to the grave until Jet Kathy's group has built it or deconstructed it. So a lot of that is, they're all moving parts. And keeping and touching down with all the different individuals at the airport is a job within itself. And um, a lot of, the, um, a lot of the, the planning and the execution and the managing of all those assets, we have to work together or we will not be successful. In addition to just the collaboration amongst ourselves and our division, we work, as you can imagine, with um, a lot of stakeholders. Uh, airlines are a key stakeholder in almost everything we do at the airport. Um, a lot of federal entities. Um, Kathy loves dealing with the FAA. She <laughs> loves because they're very consistent and know exactly what they want all the time. <laughs> um, we, we deal a lot with TSA, with Customs and Border Protection, uh, Georgia DOT, uh, Atlanta Regional Commission. Um, and then we also have the distinction of being owned by the city of Atlanta, but not in the city of Atlanta, that we're in Clayton County and College Park, and we have noise impacts. We used to have noise impacts all the way to DeKalb County, but our noise footprint has shrunk, and so thankfully we can, they're no longer impacted by the airport. Um, so we deal a lot with, in fact, Shelly Lamar, who is to be here today, that's one of her main jobs, is um, public coordination and collaboration with some of our, our neighbors. So we, uh, it's, there's a lot of moving, spinning parts. Everything is very interconnected, and we just have a huge amount of stakeholders that we deal with constantly. Um, in, the, in addition to the contracting world and the professional AE world, we, um, everybody wants to be at the airport. So it's a lot of juggling and coordination. Does that sort of get you the questions you wanted for that one? Are we in the right track? Excellent. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay, the next one, um, what projects are you all currently working on within your departments and at the airport at large? So, um, you count? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's seven pages. Seven pages. <laughs> what, what we agree to as a, as a team, we, we printed out what we call the 424 report. And what it does, it goes across all groups and all projects and at what stage they are in the project. So in printing it out, 35 times seven. there's seven <laughs> pages, and as Jamie said, there are like 35 projects on each oh, page. Oh, page Oh, so maybe six pages? Six and some are in closeout. Some are in closeout, so we're like 180 plus projects that are, are moving and going along in different, in different stages, but um, they're, they're projects. These are ongoing projects. So, um, things that are in planning, an example of projects that are in planning um, are like a lot of roof replacements right now. We're an aging facility and a lot of our roofs are old. So, I have four roof replacements I'm working on now, trying to coordinate those. Um, in addition to um, 
some pedestrian safety issues we have at the international terminal, at the service level roadway, um, down to um, parking deck um, improvements and a new parking master plan. Um, the main thing that planning and development group in planning right now is working on is updating our master plan. The last master plan, which is a long range comprehensive planning effort for the airport, was, the last one was completed in 1999, and we are in the middle of updating, um, actually creating a whole brand new one that hopefully will be finished up in the first quarter of 2014. And that's a very, um, again, looks out 20 years, it will go out to 2031, we take, do long-term forecasts, we do all sorts of derivative forecasts, big facility requirements on every aspect of the airport, come up with multiple alternatives. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a recommended solution here in the next couple of months. We're in the alternative phase right now. So soon, as some of those start coming public, you may see about those that may talk about additional gates, additional ways that we can operate aircraft, um, improvements to our train, uh, all kinds. It really it's a long-range, multifaceted piece. And we're, we're actually waited, waiting with bated breath and salivating because after they finish with the master plan, you know, that means projects. <laughs> that we funds to do, projects to do, and uh, assets to manage, and all that wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. Talk about your cool projects. Yeah, you have good ones. Well, we're good. right now. We're doing a lot of pavement replacement because, as Jamie said, it is an, an aging facility. So, um, we uh, are currently working on. Um, I don't have a pointer, but uh, over here on, you can see some white. On the uh, pavement, this is pavement we have uh, recently replaced on uh, 6 South. We're also doing some taxiway replacement. We just last year finished, if you see the white here, this is an uh, extension of Sierra Charlie so that aircraft coming in on 1028, which this is the fifth runway that we built about uh, 10 years ago, when they taxi in, they can go straight up to the uh, terminal complex and not have to go around to the uh, ends. So that's some of them. We're also rebuilding all of the roadways uh, coming into the terminal because a lot of our weaves and a lot of our decision making and our wayfinding times are too short for the volume of traffic we've got. So we're spreading things out so that uh, decision making is much more binary instead of hitting people with, you know, do you want to park? Are you turning a rental car? What air, air line are you flying? You know, it's more of a, okay, you're going to park, do this. If you're going to do a rental car, do this. Um, so that, that project should be done in the, about a year. Um, but we're also doing, uh, my group is, and there's a whole other group that does the, um, the central passenger terminal complex. It's the CPTC, which is all the concourses and the terminal. So there's a group just doing the renovations on that. And that's anything from... Uh, if you've been out there recently, we just did a, an expansion at uh, Concourse D to add concessions to make it more like Concourse A. Now we're doing Concourse C. So that group does that, which is a pretty big project. On down to, um, if you've been to D recently, we, we redid all the flooring, the ceiling, and the bathrooms on Concourse D. So the same group does all of that. So it's kind of interesting within a group, you know, you don't, we are somewhat pigeonholed in like, you know, architecture versus kind of engineering stuff, but different groups get to work on a, on a real variety of stuff. And then Jamie also worked on, we just did a lot of, um, if you've been reading the newspaper for the last, what, two years, <laughs> we rebid our concessions contract, which is a huge political issue, but once that dust settled, all that tenant space has to get renovated. And Jamie was on a team, and planning and development, we do all the reviews um, for code compliance as well as basically uh, retaining the integrity of our structure, because some of these concessionaires would just go out there and, you know, put a thousand holes in the floor, what do they care, but long term, that's going to cause Sarah a problem. <laughs> so we have a real issue trying to wrangle in our tenants. And the airlines are our tenants. The concessionaires are our tenants. And trying to keep track of what they're doing, um, especially some of the electrical stuff. We've had them just kind of go rogue and put in 
extreme electrical stuff and the next thing you know we're getting outages and they've overloaded circuits or taking capacity on circuits they weren't supposed to and you know it's it's um oh well that's yeah we just um the a380 just started flying in about a week ago so a uh, year ago, we had the preparation we had to do for that is um, they can only use the center complex, which is what we call the nine runways, nine left and nine right. So nine left is a takeoff; that's our longest runway, and nine right is one of our three landing runways. Um, we had to widen all the shoulders on both runways, as well as on taxiway Mike and taxiway Romeo, because that. The engines on that aircraft are so large, and they, it has four of them, the, the requirement is that the aircraft itself has to be over pavement. So we had to add anywhere, we, did, we ended up doing a minimum of 10 feet, but we did 10 to 20 feet on the shoulder so that as that aircraft taxis around, those engines aren't over uh, any grass where it could pick up fod or even pick up stuff and blow it onto the runway. We still, even with all of that, I don't know if you heard it, blew out a sign on takeoff. So, um, it's, it's always a learning experience. And then we had to, we modified on the south end of Concourse E gates, E1 yeah. and E3. We, we moved one jet bridge and replaced it, and then we added a large jet bridge because that aircraft, being two stories, has, is served by two jet bridges which is something we hadn't really accommodated. So, and there was a lot of concern. They are so incredibly close. They have one station. Do you have the other I It's, I mean, and the Houston had an issue with trying to get the two. They have uh, proximity sensors to keep them from running into the aircraft or an engine or whatever. And at Houston, the, their bridges are so close, they couldn't get the proximity sensor to get the jet bridges in. For whatever, we're working with Aerobridge, does a lot, they do all of our jet bridges, and there's really only jet, two jet bridge manufacturers, so I think they must have worked through that because it's slow because they're so close to bring it in, but we did get it really hard. <coughs> it looks on here that there's just mere inches in the center. I can't see it. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. If you're really interested, I'll show you. <laughs> it's really cool. It's really yeah. exciting. It's really exciting. And yes, so they, yeah, they had us all geared up for, you have to have it done by January 7th of 2013. We bought a plane. It's going to be delivered. It's coming to you. So we did this mad dash to compress all of this work. And then in early December, Airbus had an issue with cracks were showing up in the wings. And so every plane had to go back for some kind of retrofit. So that pulled out of Korean Air, that pulled one aircraft out of their rotation each month. So they said, oh, you're not going to get it for seven months. And we were ready. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's frustrating. For <laughs> they do a great job. Uh, I'm actually curious about the timeline on that, on that project. Um, when did the construction on the international terminal begin, and why was it not originally built to accommodate the NGA? Such a great question. <laughs> Such a great question. Um, construction began um, a long, long time ago. Technically, over 10 years ago, we did a small piece um, to ensure that we um, met our schedule mandated by the environmental approval for that project. And then we did some redesign, so it kind of stagnated for a while. Um, at the time, uh, we, we studied it. We studied whether we wanted the new international terminal to accommodate the A380. And it was determined by higher management and other outside influences that we weren't going to get that. They thought that Atlanta wasn't a great market for that aircraft and that we weren't going to have it. Um, some people really thought we should, as the world's busiest airport, should be prepared, at least have a <laughs> But not that people... <laughs> I didn't say it with all of us, I said we should have at least one, but um, the, uh, we lost and the, the airport management and um, the leaders downtown thought that we didn't need to spend the money. 
uh, to, to prepare it. So we, like as Kathy mentioned, modified parts of Concourse E, um, but our new international terminal can't accommodate it right now. So as you can imagine, we're now looking at retrofitting the building that's only been open 14 months, 15 months, potentially, um, but it has other issues. Operationally, concourses E and F work a little differently than most other concourses as an international facility because they are technically connected and they can't be, those passengers who have not yet gone through customs can't be intermingled with other airline passengers. They're still um, kind of sterile according to customs. So those facilities are, are separated and when you dump off 550 people on concourse E and they have to make their way to concourse F without a train, it's a little bit of an issue. So we would love to accommodate them at F the way it is now. And we can talk about that if we have more time later. Those did, is that your question? <laughs> yeah. I did you walk for me? Have you had to walk? International over and if there are any plans to make that less of a burden. Again, during I'm the moving, planning for these the moving walkways are up there. Well, most of it was already, 80% was already open before we got in one. Um, again, way back in the planning, um, the 1999 master plan, the version of the International Terminal was actually connected to Concourse E, and we didn't extend the train. Um, that had a lot of significant airfield impacts that we had to rebuild taxiways over major maintenance facilities, over lots of fill, and um, at the time the decision was made that was too pricey, so they separated the building, extended the train, which in itself was a feat and quite pricey. Um, but it does impact our ability to connect the two. Um, we looked at other ways of, of creating a secure car on our train where the passengers couldn't intermingle. We looked at some aerial issues. We looked at a lot of ways. And everything was just so expensive. Um, if you land at Concourse F and you're staying here in Atlanta, you're golden. You, don't, you go through Customs and Border Protection at F, you hit that walk into Atlanta wall, and you go outside, you're there at the curb, very, very easy. If you're connecting and you land on F, same thing. You hit that walk into Atlanta wall, you take a left, you go through security again, you're connecting. If you land on Concourse E, which is still our in an international facility, um, if you're connecting, you stay on E. You go through Customs and Border Protection just like you did before the international terminal opened. But if you land on E and you're here and it's staying in Atlanta, you have to get yourself to F. And then you go through Customs. And so it's the getting yourself from E to F that's the challenge. If you're at some of the middle gates, it's really not that far. If you're at E1 or E34, it's a bit of a walk. It's over, I think, 2,800 feet. Yeah. Um, most of we have, I think it's 60% of it is on moving sidewalks. But as you can imagine, we have language barriers. We have um, expectations of passengers that just don't realize they have to walk over half a mile. Most people may not ask for a wheelchair, but if they know ahead of time that they have to walk so far, they may have asked. So we're working with the airlines to be a little more forceful in providing customer service and um, wheelchairs. We have, um, we've since added signage and almost rest areas that talk about how much longer your walk is from this point. We have free carts. Um, we have a couple of construction issues and um, planning issues way back when that we didn't solve this problem by making the tunnels wide enough to, to use a lot of electric carts, like golf carts. So they're not really wide enough to be used in those areas, um, which would be a nice fix. So it is an issue we're working on it. Despite the longer walk, it's still much faster. It may not seem like it to you because you seem like you're walking five miles, but <laughs> it's much, much, much faster than the old way of coming into to Atlanta on Concourse E where you rechecked your bag and you had to go through security checkpoint again, get on the train, take that to the domestic terminal, and then claim your bag a second time. So while we agree this new solution is not perfect, and some people may prefer the old way, we still think it's, it's better than the old way, but there obviously is some growing pains. If you land at F, you're good. And right now, the only people that use Concourse E are Delta and then Korean for the A380. Um, so the Air France passengers have no problems. The, British Air have no problems. Um, but well, hey, F is a beautiful building. <laughs> <laughs> F is nice. It's just, well, we need the other 28 gates on Concourse E. So unfortunately, the walk is there. We're trying to set expectations a little better. I think people would react if they know. Oh, I have all this duty-free they handed me right when I got on. It's so hard to carry. You know, if you bought six bottles, it's heavy. So we added carts. Um, and if you've got a bunch of kids, 
parts, you know, and we're, we're trying to help, but I agree, it's, it's, it's Well, and Delta's done an interesting operational change where typically, you know, you bring, they would bring a, an aircraft into a gate, offload it, turn it at that gate, and, you know, then load it back up and take it out. And what we're seeing them do at International is they'll bring a flight into F, offload it, tug it to E. Mm -hmm. So it will leave from E, but it will arrive on F. And so they're maximizing the arrivals on their F gates, which we've had to adjust in our customs because in staffing the customs arrivals, we've got two arrivals halls, and they didn't really adjust for that. So they, you know, we're looking at the overall schedule and thinking, okay, these, you know, they do it in peaks, and so they staff for the peak, but then F was overloaded. So it's really interesting. Anything we build, like um, the end around that we did, um, Taxiway Victor, uh, that's the one that goes around the end of uh, 8 right. When we built it, the FAA and the tower said, we'll only use it for arrivals. We have no intention of using it to stack departures on 8 left. Well, by the time we got it built, they had, you know, a lot of the air traffic controllers had retired. We had kind of new staff. They used the hell out of that thing. And they really have from day one. So it's, anytime we, we build something, it's kind of like, okay, here it is. And then people start getting creative with how they're going to use it. And, and that's, it's interesting from a, a planning perspective because we keep adding facilities and adjusting facilities, what we think is going to happen as far as how much something's used, therefore how quickly it's going to degrade is, co is a constantly moving target. It is, and in fact, in talking, listening to Kathy, is that we have the position in asset management of actually doing assessments on all of these infrastructures. And once planning plans it and they build it, we're assessing these um, buildings and infrastructures to see if the degrading of the infrastructure is on schedule. Mm -hmm. For example, we, um, we're, we're now assessing our domestic north and south parking decks. I mean, it's been an issue for a while, you know, looking at what we're gonna do with them, are we gonna keep them, are we gonna deconstruct them, are we gonna move them to another place or not? But the thing is that once we do the assessment, once we determine what we want to do with those garages, it now has to go back to planning. That the, the years that we take in assessing the condition of it, it's still gonna take years to plan it, and then it's gonna still take years to build it, and then deciding where to build it. One of the things I would be remiss if I didn't mention, my group is actually also part of the sustainability group, and we're asset management and sustainability, and as part of that group, one of the things that we do along with assessing um, the current infrastructure, we propose to planning new and inviting things. Some they may not agree with, and, and some they do, but one thing that is really hot and heavy at the airport now is that we're trying to install the infrastructure for electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are uh, kind of a sexy thing now. People are starting to learn about electric vehicles. They're starting to find out what they can save and how much they can save by using electric vehicles and alternative fuel vehicles. So the airport, we're trying to be one of the greenest airports also. So we're looking at um, different infrastructure and different things to make the airport more sustainable and a greener airport. So EV, um, electric vehicles are one of those things. Um, solar panels, at the airport is another thing that we're looking at. And um, a lot of times if you talk to other airports, there may not be um, financial revenue associated with solar panels, but it's a good thing to do. It's, it's, a, it's a nice thing to do. And then we're also looking at, um, if you come through the airport, you're gonna find a lot of education on how we recycle at the airport, what we do with um, um, our waste as you walk through the airport. And what's really cool also, and it hasn't gotten the planning yet, so this is Jamie's first time here. What we're, <laughs> what we're looking at also is um, trying to um, put in what we call um, kinetic tiles. I heard that. 
<laughs> so we have, we have, we are looking at kinetic towels, and um, one of the things that the manufacturer that we're working with is Pagen, they're out of Europe, and what it does, it, it generates power by footfall. So if we put these electric panels in a well-trafficked area, ideally we can have charging stations for your phone, for your computer, and all this wonderful stuff, and it's alternative energy. So this is things that we're not um, pulling from the grid, and we're doing all these wonderful things. We're also looking at uh, alternative fuels. So I would be remiss because we're part of the, uh, the sustainability group also. So that's my stuff there. Tell Michael I said. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so it sounds like you guys have sort of a, an interesting dynamic of the three of you, and I'm sure your office all get to work together and really manage this specific facility, you have like a Disney World type mm -hmm. place that it's, you know, it's right there, that's the extent of what you're working on. And so I feel like that would naturally make decision making very centralized and a workflow that you can do things. But on the other hand, you, there are so many people that you actually have to ask questions of airlines and the neighbors and things like that. Can you maybe talk about how that either is maybe better than what you might find in other sort of public sector departments or is that, does it feel more private or public because you're in this very singular facility which is very mm -hmm. out of the ordinary for the public sector? Um, I think different components of the airport have different pros and cons. Um, well, Kathy's airfield stuff has to go through a lot of um, FAA issues. Nobody else really argues with us on that. We're ahead of the game in pavement design and maintenance and our pavement program and <coughs> recycling pavement. We are like People come to Kathy. So we're the airport. So in that regard, you don't have to fight a lot of those issues. She she gets to kind of operate in her own world. Um, we we because we're a city department, city of Atlanta, we still have to deal with procurement issues like the city. So that in that way always takes long. Um, and depending on if we're getting federal grants, that's another level of um, hoops that we have to jump through. But another the other end of the spectrum is like this concession stuff. That is definitely more difficult. It, it's private public partnership we have that is so, there's so much money in those concessions that they're so politically tied. We, it, it takes us a long time to make decisions um, and a really long time. Um, if we make a decision at one level about something in a space that we don't like, it can kind of get batted around a couple times and comes back and we make another decision, batted around. And sometimes that batting around and redecisioning can take a really long time and so that part I think is definitely more bureaucratic because um, it's just so many people that are interested so you, you don't get to cut through some of that bureaucracy like you can on sub, some payment things um, but I think the good thing about us we do have we're, we're all centralized at the tech campus removed from the airport so we, we kind of like to I've heard people call us like the brains of the airport because you got you have the airport and then you have tech campus and I think the good thing about that is that at Tech Campus, we're all working together. We may have our individual silos, which I think you're alluding to, but we do try to work across those silos. And in dealing with the city of Atlanta, I think they're taking notice of what the airport model is, what we're trying to do. We are a public entity, but we do have somewhat of a private feel. And as I know, when I was hired in, I came from private industry, and they were starting to hire in a lot of people at that time from private industry. And so you kind of get that feel at Tech Campus of that kind of model. But in working with the, uh, the city of Atlanta, we always will be a part of the city of Atlanta. But I think they look to the airport now for a lot of things of how we're doing business. And working um, across those silos, having good relationships, um, we still have our problems. I'm not going to try to paint a pretty picture here. But we do try to work across it. And as you can see, the results are people take off and land every day. We're still building buildings at the airport. So things get done at the airport. Mm -hmm. Does that answer you? Yes. Kind of? Oh, one of the, the questions um, talked about a second airport in Atlanta um, and the status of the project. This actually was studied, I think it wrapped up about 18 months ago. It was an ARC project that we obviously worked very closely with the Atlanta Regional Commission on. Um, and that actually had, was determined to be um, not feasible now. The cost per employee passenger for a second airport 
um, was so much higher, it's just very infeasible to ever construct. So right now it is kind of a dead issue. Um, we had lots of folks that really wanted it to work out. We, we had folks that really put a lot of effort into it. Um, the airlines right now politically, they don't want one because it's expensive and it'd be very confusing for Delta to split their operations. And we discussed, prepping for this yesterday, that most of the new airports that have built a second airport, the second airport that was built typically is to be re uh, replacing the primary. Um, and so in this in Atlanta's case, that wouldn't have been the goal. Hartsfield and Jackson would still be the primary. And it just, the financial burden of it was significantly higher. I think Shelly said it's $40 per plane passenger. Um, as, compared to, as compared to, I think it's under six, but it's, we're definitely under well under 10. Depending on what our master plan projects, that will go up, but um, we're, it's significantly expensive. And just the political will to build an airport, as you guys can imagine, nobody wants an airport in their backyard. They want it near me, but not so near me that I can't hear airplanes. So um, right now, that, that really is officially dead, even in the eyes of ARC right now. So things would have to change significantly before that's happened. There's a lot of talk always about people saying, oh, we should do a train in Nagan or a train from Chattanooga. <laughs> and while that may sound great, you guys are transportation people, it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> it just doesn't. We can talk about that for a good hour, why that doesn't work. People complain about walking from E to F to not take a train from Chattanooga <laughs> to Atlanta to take the connection. <laughs> So that do y'all have any other questions about the airport? Uh, you briefly mentioned like exchanging expertise on different walls for pavement, um, especially. But um, what other kinds of interactions do you have with other airports um, around the country or around the world? A lot. A lot. <laughs> A lot. We actually, and I'll let Kathy pick up with Jamie, but we actually just finished up on Monday. We had um, eight. Yeah. We had eight airlines to fly into Atlanta. To look at how we and um, facilities and asset management do what we do, and it was really it was a best practices of session, the sharing of information. Um, the ATL, Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport. We are so on the cutting edge of so many things that we do well that we're, we we are noticed by so many other airports, and the word is getting out that what we do, we do well. And so um, we, we interact with a lot of the airports. We're on a lot of different um, committees and organizations, um, AAAE, mm -hmm. uh, ACC, ACC ACI. ACI. And then you have on my side, you have like the IFMA groups, the BOMA groups, the um, but all of those kind of people out there that are interested in what we do at the airport. And I think a lot of people are noticing the airport because we do have a unique model. Um, sometimes, especially at the International Terminal, we were just talking about that from a facility standpoint, how that when you look at that facility, you're looking at it not just from a square footage perspective, but my boss always wants to look at it from a volumetric perspective. We told him not to go there. But this is a facility that has very high ceilings, it's very open, it's not just a brick and mortar wall. And it's almost compared to a stadium or um, a convention center. So there is some, it's a lot of uniqueness about the airport, and um, they do have their own model. And some people may agree or disagree. Yeah, I think we get tours. I bet once a week somebody's here visiting. Maybe not always in the planning and development. We have, um, I, I swear, at least six different delegations from China come yeah. every year. At least, <laughs> six. Yeah. at least six, and they bring like ten people or 20 people, um, and they'll stay for three days. We actually have um, a person on staff that it, her only job is sure. to, to international stakeholder stuff. I mean, it's her job to go, and um, we, we participate in some um, United Nations airport training that she goes around the world three or four times a year to do, and people are always coming in here. So she'll, she coordinates that all the time. We have a lot of domestic airports that will come through here too. They can pick up the phone and call us as well, more. The international folks are the ones that really come, but sometimes they come to talk 
pavement or airfield stuff, a lot of times they come to talk to our operations people because they've got some really interesting cutting edge technology they're using to track airplanes on the taxiways um, and how to calculate um, other components that we build the airlines for and, um, and even our inside the terminal construction piece. So there's always somebody calling. Whenever somebody wants to reconstruct their run runway, they call Kathy or somebody that works for Kathy because we do that better than anybody else in the world. Um, and it was planned well. Faster. <laughs> and one thing that we did just receive a reward, our, um, just putting a plug in for them also, GIS works under us and they just received an award for the, um, and you guys all know what GIS is, right? Mm -hmm. They just received an award for um, their innovation in airport management um, and developing um, what they do in GIS, so they people are recognizing um, that we do things. Sounds really like we're well. perfect, man. We are talking about nothing else around if you let airport. <laughs> so, anything? Else? Yeah. 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 Um, so I heard a statement made that I'm not sure it's true, so I'm going to basically throw it out there and get your take on it. Um, I've heard it been said that airports um, will sometimes purchase um, data on the profile of travelers going through the airport in terms of like the incomes or the zip codes that they originate, terminate from, looking at their income distribution um, so that you're better able to tailor concessions, um, the concession services and or the implication would be the concession prices um, that you're offering. And I'm wondering, um, the broader question is, you know, is that true or if there's any insight you can give into how you're setting your concession prices or rental spaces, and if that really looks at the demographic of profiles that's using um, the airport? Um, I can't speak for exactly what the concessions folks pull off data. I, I think that probably is somewhat true. I don't know how um, calculated they are. I do know that we pull information when we do our forecasts. Um, when we do our master plan right now, we look up 30 years, and in order to do our um, local origination and destination passenger traffic, that's basically tied to local economy. So we do pull that data for that, certainly. Um, the, the concessionaire folks are an interesting group that we all interact with. Um, and I don't know exactly how they do it. I always joke with them, like, who buys a $2,000, you know, trend coat in the airport? And like, why, you know, I, you know, I can't shop at the airport, right? So I always tease them, but they're making money. Um, and when, they, when the stores don't, they'll, they'll ask for a concept change. So but we, we do have in our concessions contracts like for food a requirement for them to market price it. Uh, you know it is more expensive for say Chick-fil-A to operate out of the airport. Number one, the employees have to either ride hard or take or pay for parking and it takes them longer to get there. They also have to all be cleared through security so that kind of somewhat limits their pool. So but we still require them to basically match or marginally exceed. It's street pricing plus 10%. Yeah. They're, that they're allowed for food and beverage. But you're right. With the new change out of our concession program now, we've gone to much higher end things. And um, Well, not over all. A well, lot well, of them. We're getting, we're getting some complaints from you know the cheap pilots that don't get their $2 tacos anymore. They have to spend $8 on lunch. And, so we're getting it, some feedback like that. But the data must have shown that we needed to up our game. <laughs> yeah. No more Duck and Donuts. No more Duck No, there is a V1 yet. That's coming back on Comfort Speed. Coming back. It's coming back. I'm going to get one of these. It's coming back. Any other questions? OK, so have you um, worked with, um, in the face of expansion pressures, have you been part of trying to promote high-speed rail as an alternative? We've been absolutely on uh, a lot of uh, study groups on that. Sure, we do. We have staff devoted, staff hours devoted to that. Absolutely. Shelly, the other person that was going to attend, has been on every high-speed rail study in the last 15 years in the Atlanta area, representing the airport. And we've retained a corridor yeah. Yeah. coming into F to accommodate rail. Hmm. Maybe not the actual train but right, a, a connection right. from whatever station on the east side so absolutely we're not against high-speed rail at all no we've been very pro high-speed rail it's just when just not as a second <laughs> all right if there are any more questions any, any more questions before we close up all right
and we can thank our panel again for coming to visit. Yes.